بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد قال الإمام أحمد رحمه الله تعالى أصول سنة عندنا التمسك بما كان عليه أصحاب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم والاقتداء بهم وترك البدع وكل بدعة فهي ضلالة وترك الخصومات والجلوس مع أصحاب الأهواء We have three issues to deal with today, inshallah, concerning the fundamentals of the Sunnah that Al Imam Ahmed Minji. Last week we dealt with the first Asul Asil, the importance of following the companions, radiallahu anhu, and we explained that, that everybody here, you're not a real Muslim until your Islam is similar to the Islam of Abu Bakr. Umar, Uthman, Ali, and the rest of the companions, radiallahu anhu. I'm not shy or hesitant to say to everybody here, if you come to Umu Qiyamah and you have an idea that Abu Bakr didn't have, you're doing an ibadah that Abu Bakr wasn't doing, you're doing something trying to get close to Allah by doing that thing, and those companions didn't know about it, by the rub of the Kaaba, what you're doing is going to be thrown back at you, you will be out and you may be punished. The Islam that Allah Ta'ala is going to accept is the Islam that those companions were upon, Rabbi Allah Ta'ala. We explain that. After that, Imam Ahmed mentioned also from the fundamentals of the Sunnah, from the foundations that a person has to have, is that he has to abandon, he has to avoid innovations, the bid'ah. And the other thing he mentioned is that the individual he has to leave alone argumentation and sit with the people of innovation, the people of desires. So we have three issues that we have to deal with today, shall we? And Imam Ahmed Akhwani, as we mentioned, is an island from the ulama of Islam. He doesn't just talk off of the top of his head when he mentions things and there's a tartib since he's an imam of that state, stature, that level, he read the Qur'an, he understood the Qur'an, he knows the Sunnah very well, he's going to be affected and impact, impacted by the asalib of the Qur'an and the asalib of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he came and he focused on certain things in al Islam, his turkeys and his focus on those things, it wasn't abathan, it was with hikmah. So Al-Imam Ahmed is saying the very first thing we have to do is have the Islam of the companions. He said that for a reason. And then after that, the next thing that he would mention was innovation. From the Asul of the Sunnah is abandoning innovation. Allah Ta'ala from his Rahmah upon us, as he said in the Quran, Today, I have completed for you my favors, and I have completed for you your religion, and I'm pleased to choose for you as a religion, Al-Islam. Al-Islam is not a need of any. I'm a Bakr, Zay, Tom, Dick, Harry, anybody coming, introducing in this religion what the Prophet didn't bring, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and anybody who believes it's okay to do anything that's a bid'ah, getting close with Allah, what he is saying is he has more knowledge than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because if it was good, and if it was from the religion, he would have mentioned it sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As he said, مَا مِنْ شَيْءٍ يُقَرَّبُكُمْ إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ إِلَّا أَمَرْتُكُمْ بِهِ وَمَا مِنْ شَيْءٍ يُقَرَّبُكُمْ مِنَ النَّارِ إِلَّا نَهِيْتُكُمْ عَنْهُ There is nothing that will get you people close to Allah, to the Jannah, except that I told you to do it. Have Tawheed, Birru Walidain, Al-Hajj, Al-Sadaqa, all of those things he told us to do. Tahiyyat to Masjid, sit in the Masjid, make the Dhikr of Allah, all of that will get you to Jannah. So he told us what to do. And he said, nothing will make you go to the hellfire except that I made it haram. 
So he told us everything we need to know. No one comes and introduces in this religion something except that his lisan al-hal, his condition is saying, I know more than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa But we have to take some time out to explain what is the innovation that Imam Ahmed is talking about. Innovation, the word bid'ah, is why many people misunderstand it from this ummah. There are those people who, something that they don't know, something that they don't do, they'll say that's an innovation. Every newly invented issue is not an innovation. We can use this microphone. It wasn't there during the time of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. We can use this camera. It's not considered to be an innovation. We can use so many things. These things are innovations, but these are not what the Prophet was talking about, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So you find people who come to you and you tell them, hey, that dhikr that you're doing is not from al-Islam. That celebration that you're doing is not from al-Islam. They'll say, yeah, but nor was this there when the Prophet was here, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They don't understand. The innovation is something that's new. It's newly invented. Islam is not against modernity. You young brothers, many of you want to go to the University of Medina, and I encourage you to go overseas where the Arabs are and learn your religion. I encourage that. But if everybody went to the University of Medina and they learned only al Islam, our um is going to be in trouble in the future. We need people who are into other sciences. Al Islam is not against modernity new inventions. What Islam is against is new inventions in the religion. Allah Ta'ala described himself as Badiru Samawati al He is the originator of the heavens and the earth. Badir, he is Al-Badir. The word Bid'a is from that word. It means the heavens and the earth, they were not here at one time and Allah is the one who brought it into existence. It wasn't here. He told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Qul Ma kuntu bid'an min al-rusul. Tell your people, Ya Muhammad, I'm not the first messenger who came. I'm not a bid'ah, the first person who came. Yeah, there were other prophets and messengers before me. That's the linguistic word that is being used in the Quran. But this bid'ah that Imam Ahmed is referring to is not that one. He's talking about the one in the religion that is a problem. What happened with Ahlul Kitab, the Yahud and the Nasara, as Allah Ta'ala mentioned about them in the Quran, Rahbaniyatan ibtadu'uha, ma kitabnaha alayhim. They did some aesthetic thing. It was a bid'ah, Allah said. We didn't tell them to do that like the monk. He says, I'm not going to get married. The lady who's a nun, she says, I'm not going to get married. I'm going to stay in the monastery cut myself off from the dunya and just focus on ibadah to Allah. Allah called that a bid'ah because it's in the religion. That's what's not permissible. That's what's not permissible. For those of you who are writing, you have to understand this. There are two types of bid'ah in al-Islam. Two types of bid'ah. One type is called al-bid'ah to al haqiqiyatu The real innovation. It has no proof on it whatsoever. Like hating the companions. There's no delil in the Qur'an, no ayat in the Qur'an, no hadith that can remotely suggest it's permissible to hate the companions. That's a real innovation. We're in the month of Al-Muharram. After a few more days, on the day of Ashura, some people are going to burn, hit, hit themselves and cut themselves, hit themselves in the head. There's no delil in the Qur'an and the Sunnah to prove that. Nothing. Not from close, not from far. It's a complete innovation. You have no delil for it. You can't bring a single ayah. It's called the real innovation. And then the second type of innovation is the one that gives most of the people the problems. It's called the bid'ah al-idafiya. The bid'ah al-idafiya. That's the innovation that, from one angle, it has a delil. It has a delil. But the way it's being done and understood is wrong. For an example, a dhikr. There are many ayat that tell us to make a dhikr. Many ahadith that tell us to make the dhikr. Many. So we want to come together here in this masjid and we sit in a circle, we put bukhur and we go back and forth, Allah, 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 Allah. 
There are ayat, Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma inna al With the dhikr of Allah, the hearts are tranquil. That's an ayat of the Quran. But the way we're practicing that is the problem. Did the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam legislate that? Did his companions do that? So the bid'ah, where the person tries to get close to Allah by doing something in the religion, he has a dhalil on one hand, and on the other hand, he's doing it the wrong way. And that's what the community has the biggest problem with. Innovation of that type. The salat, for an example, is legislated. Fasting is legislated. But a person is going to fast, he's going to fast on a specific day that has not been legislated because of that particular day. One example, the day that my mother died, I'm going to fast every day on that day, all my life. No, that's an innovation. Fasting is from Islam. But the way you're doing it is not correct. Concerning the issue of innovation, khwani, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as you know, every Friday, without exception, if he got on his member, he said what is known as khutbatul haja, every Friday. Anytime he wanted to do a nikah, just like us, people were getting married every week, every month, people were getting married. Whenever he wanted to address the issue, or any issue, he would say khutbatul haja. The companion said, كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يعلمنا الحاجة كما يعلمنا سورة من القرآن He used to teach us خطبة الحاجة with the same emphasis that he taught us the Quran. So they heard it a lot. In خطبة الحاجة, he used to say, صلى الله عليه وسلم Verily, in the خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله وشر الأمور محدثاتها Every Friday on the member, the companions are sitting there and they're waiting to listen to the Sayyid of Bani Adam and the Khatam of the Anbi and the Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They want to hear, what does he have to say today? Every Friday, every talk, every khutbah, Eid, Juma, all the time. The best speech is the speech of Allah. The best guidance is the guidance of Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the worst affairs, are the innovations, the newly invented things that were introduced in the religion. And every innovation is going astray, and every going astray leads to the hellfire. He will say that over and over and over and over again. You know that the Nabi used to say to the people things multiple times, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for ta'heed, ad-deenu nasiha, ad-deenu nasiha, ad-deenu nasiha. No one here speaks like that. No one here. The way that he talks, he doesn't repeat things three times just to do it. No one. It's not the way we talk. But the Nabi was a muballid, rasul, Nabi. He has to talk to the people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when he used to speak, he, sp that he spoke very slowly, very clearly and articulate, and he used to repeat things multiple times. Every week for his whole life in al Medina with the khutbah, every dars, every lecture, every Every time he said to the people, this khutbah al haja and he taught them khutbah al haja with the same emphasis of the Qur'an, and then we come today and we say, no, some innovation is okay. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, he also mentioned, as has been collected by Imam al-Bukhari Muslim and the authority of our mother Aisha. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man ahdatha fi amrina hadha ma laysa minhu fa huwa rabb. Anyone who comes and he introduces something in this religion that is not from it. He didn't say anyone who introduces something in the dunya. Anyone who comes and introduces something in this affair of ours, the deen, it will be rejected no matter who he is. Many ahdatha. That's from the balada of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Any person who does it, any individual. Another hadith said, this guy, he introduces something. He's the one who did it. It's rejected. He said in his other narration, anyone who does it. He didn't introduce it, he just did it. Anyone who does something that is not from our affair, it will be rejected. So the person has to have sincerity in what he's doing, and it has to be in accordance to the sunnah, or it's going to be rejected. No matter how sincere he was, no matter how sincere, if he did it in the wrong place, at the wrong time, with the wrong mode, the method, it will be rejected. 
even if he had the cross. And who is it that's going to determine many people have the cross? When I became a Muslim, I knew some people in America who believed it was permissible to go and rob local stores and then to take the money from the store and to give it to the masjid. He had ikhlas in that understanding. So it's not enough to have ikhlas, it has to also be with the proper way and the proper mode. Khwani, some innovations are more serious than others, depending upon what's being done, when it's being done, and where it's being done. Like the hadith about al Medina, al Medina al Nabawiya. Al Medina al Nabawiya, the Prophet said it's a special place. A salat in his message is 1,000 prayers. We just prayed salat al Asr, just one salat. In Mecca, this one salat, 100,000. In Al Medina, 1,000. In Bayt al Maqdis, may Allah Ta'ala purify it and protect it from the dhulm of the dhulm. In Bayt al Maqdis, the salat is 250. One salat that you make. So those places are from the sacred places of Islam. At Dajjal, can't get into Mecca or Al Medina. The Prophet said about Al Medina, his Medina, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Men ahdatha fiha. Anyone who does an innovation in Medina or he protects an innovator in Medina, then the curse of Allah will be upon him and the curse of the angels and the curse of all mankind because the place is special. The bid'ah is a mushkira, but some of them are greater than others, but all of them are a problem. And the shaitan, he loves for one of us to do innovation more than he loves for us to do the sins like drinking khamr and eating pot. Everybody knows drinking khamr is haram. Everyone knows zin is haram. Everyone knows gambling is haram. But people do innovations thinking that they're doing the right thing. He won't make tawbah from it. Rasulullah says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in Allah, Ihtajaba at tawbata an kulli sahib bid'atin hatta yada'aha. Allah will put a veil. He'll put a veil over the eyes, the heart, the mind of a person who does innovation until he lets it go. Because he doesn't think he's doing the wrong thing. If you come to him and you say, Yahi, Yahi, this thing that you're doing, don't do it. He won't make tawbah, he'll fight you, and he'll even, he'll even, even accuse you. You don't love Rasulullah. You don't love Rasulullah. So, ikhwatifillah. From al-Islam, is for every single individual to feel an aversion against innovation. In al-Islam, Abdullah bin Mas'ud asked the people during that time, كَيْفَ بِكُمْ إِذَا لَبِسِدْكُمْ fitna." How is it going to be when the fitna comes? They said, what do you mean, Abu Abdurrahman? He said, in the fitna, the older person, the older person, he will crawl, and the younger person will walk. During that time, the innovation is going to become the sunnah, and the sunnah will become the innovation. If someone changed something about that innovation, the people are going to say, he's changing the religion. That's the time that we're living in right now. The Gurba of Al-Islam. You can't find a masjid in Al-Islam except it has to have a mihrab in it. Scholars of Al-Islam like Al-Imam Shafi, Al-Imam Ahmed, they used to say this mihrab is not from our religion. This is not the mihrab in the Quran. I don't mean this to put you people down or to say that the administration we should kick them out. I'm trying to make a point. You can't find a masjid except when we build and make the masjid, we have to have the mihrab. The person says, but Allah mentioned the mihrab in a number of ayat of the Quran. Allah Ta'ala mentioned about Maryam. كُلَّمَا دَخَلَ عَلَيْهَا زَكَرِيَا كُلَّمَا دَخَلَ عَلَيْهَا زَكَرِيَا زَكَرِيَا وَجِدَ عِنْدَهَا Ancient ayat. كل ما دخل زكريا المحراب وجد عنده رزقا قال يا مريم أن لك هذا قالت هو من عند الله إن الله يرزق من يشاء بغير حساب. Every time Zakaria went into the mihrab of Maryam, 
he found that she had some risk. He said, Maryam, where did you get this stuff? She said, Allah gave it to me. Allah gives a risk to what they, he, he wants. It was a miracle that she would have that food. She didn't go out to work. Ibn Kathir and those Ulama of Tafsir said she used to have food that only grows in the summertime. It only grows in the summer. She would have it in the winter. Fruit that only grows in the wintertime, she would have it in the summer. She didn't go out. It's a murjiza. The lady was a murjiza. So the ayah said he went into her mihrab. So it's in the Quran. Allah is not talking about this. The mihrab in al Islam, even with the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and it's a sunnah that people have abandoned. The mihrab is the special place in your house where you pray. It's the place of prayer in your house. And the Nabi used to have that in his house. A special place, that's where he used to make the salah. It's permissible to pray in any room other than the toilet. Akramakumullah. You can pray upstairs, downstairs, whatever you want. But the sunnah of the Nabi وسلم, is that he intentionally made a place where he prayed in his house all the time. That's from the sunnah. And that's the mihrab. It's not this thing, extra money, extra this, extra that. So the point here is, we're living during that time, the time in which the innovation has become al-Islam. And what's the sunnah? It's the innovation. It's the thing that people are upset with. So identifying innovation comes with getting knowledge and so forth and so on. In addition to that, ikhwani, and Imam Ahmed, he mentioned from the asul of the Sunnah is leaving off argumentation. Al khusumat in the religion. Not being a person who is argumentative and wanting to argue all the time. Being argumentative is a characteristic that Allah gives it like an argumentative person. A woman, the Arabs call her the Lagwa, the Lagwa. Her lisan, she talks tough. She always has something to say. There's that individual who's always clashing, who always has to argue. And in the religion, you have different Muslim groups, different madhabs. We come together and we're arguing all the time. It's a characteristic that Allah doesn't like. He said in the Quran, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يُعْجِبُكَ قَوْلُهُ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَيُشْهِدُ اللَّهُ عَلَى مَا فِي قَلْبِهِ وَهُوَ أَشَدُّ الْخِصَابِ From the people of those people who, when you listen to them, their speech seems pleasing and alluring. And he calls Allah to, to witness what's in his heart. But when you look at him, he's the biggest arguer, just arguing. The Prophet says, said Bukhari Muslim, on the authority of our mother Aisha to Allah Ta'ala the most hated person by Allah is the one who's always arguing, always arguing. Always. He has to argue. He wants to argue, argue. Argue about the deed is the worst argument, and arguing in the dunya as well. Just argumentation, argumentation. So from the sunnah is to abandon these types of arguments. My way of seeing it is, roughly a day is from the sunnah. That's what I see, that mas'ala. He sees roughly a day is not from the sunnah. So I hate him based upon that. I'm going to give the khutbah. I'm going to give the khutbah roughly a day. Next week, roughly a day. Third week, roughly a day. After six months, I get on the member and I say, okay, this is dars number 500 about roughly a day. Nah. I just say my point of view and I try to convince you. You convince me and then that's it. I go my way, you go your way. And we're brothers in the religion. Look at some of the narrations that we brought to you, just a few, from the lips of our ulama, the ulama of the madahib, that we honor with love respect. Praise God in Islam, student of Sheikh Islam in Mauritania. His name is Ibn Rajab. Ibn Rajab al Hanbali. A lot of good books in Islam. He has a book that's been translated into English. I advise every student of knowledge to get that book. It's called Jami Al Bayan. Jami Bayan Fadl Al Ilmi. It's in English. It brings together the virtues of knowledge and the people of knowledge and getting knowledge of the deen. He brought an incident that transpired between a man who was doing the time of an Imam Malik. 
His name was Al Haytham ibn Jamil. He said to Al Imam Malik, Rahimullah Ta'ala, Ya Aba Abdullah, Al Rajul Yakul Alim and Bis Sunnah. Are you Jabir Ayha? Call Al Imam Malik, La. Walakin, Yukhbir Bis Sunnah, Fa in Kubilat, Fa Bihi wa Nirma, Wa illa Sakata. The man said to Al Imam Malik, Big scholar. A person is a scholar, he knows about the Sunni, he has knowledge, and the people may not know about the Sunnah. Should he argue with the people about the Sunnah, to teach them the Sunnah, to defend the Sunnah, to spread the Sunnah, bring it to the intention? Should he argue? He said, don't argue. He said, just tell the people, tell the people. If they accept it, alhamdulillah. If they reject it, just be quiet. That doesn't mean that you just tell someone the sunnah is this and you're quiet. It means you try to explain to people. You try to get them to understand. But if they don't accept it, don't make that an issue where you're going to allow yourself to be constantly fighting with that individual. That's what Al-Imam Malik, Al-Imam Ahmed, Rahimullah Ta'ala, who said to him, Ya Aba Abdullah, Ya Aba Abdullah, Akunu fi majlis, Laysa fihi man ya'rafu sunnah, ليس فيه من يعرف السنة غير فتكلم الرجل مبتدع أرد عليه قال الإمام مالك الإمام أحمد لا لا تنصب نفسك لهذا أخبره بالسنة ولا تخاصر قال الرجل ولكن الإمام أنا الوحيد في المجلس أعرف السنة قال الإمام أحمد ما أراك إلا مخاصم فما سبب الإمام أحمد I'm in the assembly with the people, and I know the sunnah, and they don't. I know the correct thing, and they don't. Should I argue with them about what I know the truth, the sunnah, should I argue with them? He said, no. Just tell them what the sunnah is, and that's it. He said, but, but I know. They don't know. I know. And he was insistent, persistent. And Imam Ahmed said, I see you as a person who just wants to argue. I told you what to do. Some of our young brothers came to me last week and I advised you brothers, and I continue to say this, all of this fitting that goes on in Liverpool, in Birmingham, in the dunya, this fitting connected with the Muslimin, I tell you, learn your religion, beneficial knowledge, learn the tajweed of the Quran, memorize the Quran, it will keep you preoccupied, and it's ilmu nafir, ask for who said what, when did he go? When did he sit? What, did, what do you have to say about him? What? That is a waste of time. Some of our Shabbat today, that's what they wake up on. That's what they eat on. That's what they drink on. Some of them, even when they sleep, that's what they see in their dreams. Argumentation. Because people don't know and they're arguing with each other. Argumentation in the, in the religion is not permissible. As for, here's a brother who wants the truth. And he has the ability to give his point of view and to listen to the other point of view. And you go back and forth with an argumentation that's going to bring out a good nitija, a good result. That's permissible. The argumentation that is not permissible is the one that's just a waste of time. I'm trying to overpower you with my muscles and you're overpowering me. And I'm not listening to you and you're not listening to me. It's not permissible. That type of argumentation is not permissible. Look what happened in Qawani and Imam Malik and those scholars of the past. Allah mentioned in the Quran just as an example. Allah has some names and attributes. We're going to come to that inshallah. He has some names and attributes. In Al-Islam, Allah said in this Quran, Al-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa. Allah al-Rahman is over his throne in a way that befits his majesty. I don't know how. But that's what he said in the Quran. There were some Muslims who came, unlike Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, when they heard that ayah, we never saw, we never read, where they said, Ya Rasulullah, how is he over his throne? When? Why? They didn't see that. They heard the ayah, and they believed. Just like that. But now the Muslims, after mixing with the Greeks, and the Romans, and the Persians, the Ajim, and philosophy, Muslims started asking questions. How? Why? When? Where? So some man came to Imam Malik. He said, hey, Imam Malik, I want to debate you and argue with you about this ayah. 
In one incident, and he got mad at it like this. As for me, I know my religion. You go look for someone who's in doubt like yourself, and he wouldn't give him any words. And he had the ability to argue with Allah. He had the ability to deal with him. But he wanted to show the people, I don't argue with my religion. I know my religion. I know my religion. I'm not like you. Another man came at another time. He said, I want to debate you, argue with you about where Allah is and how he is. He said, okay. And if you defeat me, you overpower me, what should I do? He said, you should follow me. He said, okay, and if I beat you in the argument, when we talk, what should you do? He said, I'll follow you, your point of view. He said, okay, what if a third man comes and he overpowers both of us? He said, we should follow him. He said, I don't change my religion like that. Every time someone comes with the ability to overpower me in the argument, I'm going to follow him, change my thought, and that's why those people of the past used to say, Ahlul Bidah Akhar Mas Talumay. The people of innovation, because they don't have any usul and asas that's thabit, they change every day. One day he's with those guys, next day over here he's making takfir of the Muslims, killing the Muslims, next day over here he's doing something else, over there he leaves the religion, he came back. But the people who have fundamentals, usul, they're thabit and they're protected. So argumentation in the religion, ikhwani, is what the Salaf were against. And Imam Ahmed did mention, thirdly, from the Asul of the Sunnah, is to avoid sitting with people of innovation and people of desires. Not sitting with people who have crazy ideas about Islam. That's from Islam. But I need you to really understand this point. One of the most important messages in Al Islam is about unity. The white brother over there is my brother. Jewish guy became a Muslim. He was a Yehudi. Yesterday he's a Muslim now. That's my brother. I have to eat with him, deal with him, give him his heart, show him love, protect him, advise him. This is my Somali brother. One of the most important messages of Islam is coming together and not avoiding and abandoning each other. Al Hajjah, to abandon. The asl of al hajj the hukum is a tahreem. You shouldn't abandon people in Islam. That's the original or the asl of the mas'ala. Abandoning is something we shouldn't do. The description of the Muslim, the mu'min, is that he connects. The Prophet told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-mu'min lil-mu'min kal-bunyan, yushuddu ba'dahu ba'da. The believer to his brother, is like a solid, like a solid cement structure. The bricks, they solidify each other. I need a ride to the train station. I don't have a car, I'm not from here. I can walk to the train station, but it's going to be a problem. I need my brothers to help me. That's how we are. That hadith shows that the believer is with the other believers. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al Mu'min Ya'lam. The believer is the one who is sociable. There's no good in the one who doesn't connect to people. He doesn't initiate visiting and seeing and sitting with them. Nor does he accommodate. That's a hadith that shows we don't abandon people. The description of the movement is to be with the believers. To be a part of the masjid. This masjid is not perfect. Administration, not perfect. The people, not perfect. Every time I see something I don't like, I cut the people off. قَالَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمَ الْمُؤْمِنَ الَّذِي يُخَالِقُ النَّاسِ وَيَسْرُوا عَلَىٰ أَذَاهُ خَيْرُ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنَ الَّذِي لَا يُخَالِقُ النَّاسِ وَلَا يَسْرُوا عَلَىٰ أَذَاهُ The believer who mixes with the people and he's patient with what he sees from them that he doesn't like. He's better than the one who doesn't mix with the people. And he's not patient. If you, and we know people like this, you can't tolerate the Muslims, so you go and live far away by yourself. The one who has money, he lives where the non-Muslims live, far away. The Nabi says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the one who is far away, the sheep, the sheep that's far away, he is the one who the wolf is going to get. As we're sitting here, if the wolf came to get us, the sheep, as we're sitting here, 
If the wolf ran in to get someone, because of our numbers, when we disperse, he's not going to know what to do. But if you say to yourself, you see that tree over there? See that tree? It's the grass. It's all by itself. I'm going to go over there and just eat from the tree all by myself. That wolf is going to hone in on you, and when he comes to get you, he's focused. So what did he mean, the wolf gets the sheep like that? A shaitan, he gets the Muslim who lives by himself. The Somali lady who comes to this country by herself, the Yemenese lady who comes to this country by herself, Somali man, Yemeni man, come to this country by yourself, you don't have anybody, your Jamaat, your brothers, your sisters, we saw with our own eyes what happens. <laughs> Not to everybody, but it happened. That's from this lesson. So we come together. Al Asl in Al Hajr is Tahreem. Be with the people. The Nabi told the people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, La Tababagu, Wala Tahasagu, Wala Tabadaru, Wala Tabadaru, Wala Kukulu, Ibadullah Ikhwalim, La Yahmili Muslim, and you hajjim Akhahu Fuk, Fala Ayyam. Don't be mad at each other. Don't be envious of one another and don't turn away from each other. But be servants of Allah, be brothers. It is not permissible for the Muslim to abandon his brother more than three days. I had a problem with him. Islam gives us three days to calm down and to sort it out. The Nabi says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in Hajar, Akhahu Muslim, Salatin, Fahuwa, Kasafki Damihi. Anyone who boycotts his brother for one year, it's like spilling his blood. Not only do we boycott our Muslim brother for more than one year, we boycott our biological brother, sister, mother, father for more than one year. Islam is telling you, don't do that. Turfu al-a'mal kull yawm al-ithneen wal-khamis fayaghfir Allah ta'ala li kulli abd al-Muslim لَنْ يُشْرِكَ بِهِ شَيْئًا إِلَّا رَجُلٍ كَانَ بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ أَخِيهِ شَحْنًا يُقَالْ أُتْرُكُ هَذَيْنِ حَتَّى يَصْطَلَى Every Monday and Thursday, the deeds that you did, they go to Allah and Allah accepts them and He forgives everyone for their mistakes. Every Muslim, except the Muslim, the man who's making shirk, Allah won't forgive him. He's making shirk with Allah. الْبِدَعَ حَقِيقِيَا he is making shirk with Allah. He believes that the 12 Imams, they can get him into Jannah, the 12 Imams, you make dua to them and istighadha be him, and you make dua to the Nabi, shirkun haqiqi, bid'a haqiqiya, not permissible. And the other person whose deeds won't be accepted is the individual who he has drama with his brother. <laughs> They're split. So all of those ahadith, they show what? They show that we're supposed to be together. And what I see, what I smell, what I hear, that I don't like from you, I have to be patient, and you have to be patient with me. But Al-Islam has allowed. When people do certain things, then they can, be they can be avoided. They can be avoided because of their evil. They can be avoided because that's the jazat and the thawab of what they did. They can be avoided so that you can be protected. The boy, he committed zina with a lady. She was married and he wasn't. The Prophet وسلم, had the lady stoned to death. The boy was flogged and then he was put outside of Medina for one year. He couldn't come back into Medina. There was a man during the time of Umar He was walking around to the people read an ayat of the Qur'an that were difficult to understand. In the last Jews of the Qur'an, there are some ayat, most Arabs, if you read some of these ayat, they don't know what it's talking about. So that man was asking, what about this, what about that? Confusing the people. Umar radiallahu anhu heard about him. He said, bring him. When they brought him, Umar hit him in his head a few times. Hit him, hit him, hit him. He said, Amir al okay, if you're trying to kill me, then kill me once and for all. Kill me totally. Because the jinn that I had, that was in my head making me do that tashwish, is gone now. I'm in Toba. I'm sorry. I won't do it again. Umar radiallahu anhu, after the man made Toba, Umar said, now get out of Medina for one year. He boycotted him, left him out of Medina. The Prophet ﷺ used to boycott his wives. 
They would do something, he would stay away from them for 29 days. When he would come, all he would say is, Salaamu Alaikum, is everything okay? And they would leave because they did something that wasn't acceptable. The general rule, the general rule is no boycott. But because someone is doing something, you have to boycott them. People of innovation, people of desires. The Dajjal, when he comes, the Dajjal, he has to be boycotted. You can't go to him being inquisitive, trying to find out what's going on. You have to run away. When you hear about him, there's a man, he's doing this, he's doing that, he says that he's Allah, and da 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 da. Don't go to say, I don't believe that, let me go soon. You have to go the other way. You have to boycott him. The Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the camel that is sick in his legs, in his nose, in his ears, in his mouth, he has worms and germs. He's sick. He said, don't let that camel drink from the same trough, the water that the good camel was drinking from. The one who was sahih, you have to let him drink by himself. So that that sickness doesn't get into him. Boycott. In our homes, in our homes, some of our youngsters, this is a real life situation. Some of our youngsters, our children are cancers. The eldest son, the eldest daughter, he or she is a cancer spreading through the body of the house. And if you don't cut it off, if you don't cut it off, it's going to kill the whole body. It's not easy to cut that arm off. It's not easy. But look what she's doing. And she's not trying to listen. It's a difficult decision to make. And before making that decision, the mother and the father have to be sure. But sometimes, Rahma, it deserves Shidda. And being Shadeed, you're having Rahma on people. Right? When people commit Zina, the community has to come and we have to look at it. It's not nice to see that. It's not nice to see it. But in looking at that, it's Rahma on us to say, don't do that. It's a determinant. So those people who are the people of innovation from the fundamentals of the religion is to avoid them. But that has fit to it. We'll come to that, inshallah. What's the deal for that? There are many ayat and hadith. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran and Surah Ali Imran in the beginning, Uwa al-ladhi anzala alayka al-kitab minhu ayatun muhtamatun hunna umu al-kitab wa ukharu mutashabihat فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ فَيَتَّبِعُونَ مَا تَشَابَهَ مِنْهُ اِبْتِغَاءَ الْفِتْنَةِ وَابْتِغَاءَ تَعْوِيلِ وَمَا يَعْلَمُ تَعْوِيلُهُ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَالْرَاسِفُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ يَقُولُونَ آمَنَّا بِي كُلُّ مِنْ عِنْدِ رَبِّنَا وَمَا يَذَّكِّرُوا إِلَّا أُولُ الْأَلْبَابَ Allah is the one Ya Muhammad who revealed to you this Quran. In this Quran, are ayat that are easy to understand. They are the mother of the book. And in this book are other ayat that not many people understand. People don't understand those ayat. They're ambiguous. They're ambiguous. No one knows the meaning except Allah about those ayat. Those people who have a disease in their hearts, they want to go after those difficult ayat to understand. Those who want to make fitna, that's what they do. Allah said, the people endowed with knowledge, the rasikhun and knowledge, they say all of it is from Allah. The ayat that are easy to understand, the ayat that are not easy to understand. Yasin, alif la mean, ta, what does it mean? I don't know. This man over here, he wants to insist, he wants to give a thirst, the meaning of these ayat. Yasin means, ya insan, it's one of the names of the Nabi, and he's just talking, just talking. Don't go after those ayat, Allah, you don't know them. No one knows. Ayat, no one knows what they mean, except Allah. You just have to believe in it. The Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after reading this ayat, Aisha said, Rasulullah read this ayat, and then he said, Ya Aisha, if you see the people who are going after these ayat, then they're the ones that Allah Ta'ala was talking about. فَحْضَرُوهُمْ So stay away from them. Stay away from them. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Qur'an وَإِذَا رَأَيْتَ الَّذِينَ يَخُودُونَ فِي آيَاتِنَا فَأَعْرَضْ عَنْهُمْ حَتَّى يَخُودُوا فِي حَدِيثٍ غَيْرِهِ If you see someone 
talking about our ayat, discussing about these ayat. If you see them joking with the religion and talking about things that are confusing, Allah said, then get away from them until they change their speech. Don't sit with those people. The believers, don't sit with those people. The Ibad al-Rahman, the people of knowledge is that, they don't sit with these people who are debating on the internet, debating back and forth with Christians and Jews, and, and you don't know what, you don't have knowledge about the basics of your religion. Everyone's just arguing back and forth. That's not our religion. I love you. What if I marru be loved marru kirama? The believer is the one that if he passed by vain speech, he passed he passes it by with honor. He doesn't sit in to say, okay, let me hear what you guys are talking about. This is wasting time. And the people of innovation, they are people of vain speech. But what's the meaning of this particular principle? Does it mean every single Muslim who is ignorant? I can't sit with him because this masjid has a mihrab in it. Everybody here is an innovator, so I can't pray here. Someone comes to this masjid and he gets on the minbar and he says something that's not correct. We know it's not correct. Now do I stop coming to Masjid al Rahma because this man says something that's incorrect or someone's in Is that the meaning of abandoning people of desires? That's not the meaning of it. That's not the meaning of it. If a Muslim doesn't know what our community doesn't, doesn't know, people don't know, we have to try to give them down. We have to try to educate them. How many people were here amongst us? Most of us feel, I need more knowledge. Why am I acting? Abu Usama. Why am I acting like I'm from the ulama and I'm better than everybody else? And I know more than everybody. Who from amongst us is an island here? Who? Why are you dealing with people like that? As soon as you meet someone, he can be an older man with you. Red beard with, with, with white beard, your grandfather, and, and look at him and deal with him like that. We don't sit with people of innovation. No, you have to sit with people and give them dollar and a lot. Sit with people of innovation, people who don't know. Boycotting, it has its rules and regulations. The law of it. The law of it. If the church people, the church people, called me up and said, We want you to come and tell us who is Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I'm gonna say, no, you kuffar, you people of desires. I'm not gonna go and say that. I'm gonna say, what? You're gonna give me a free opportunity and I can come and you're gonna sit and listen and I can give you that, I'm gonna come. Unless, unless, in going there, I'm gonna compromise the truth. By going there, it's going to make the Muslims think, for an example, it's permissible to pray there. For an example, Umar the Allah when he conquered Palestine, Jerusalem, and he went to take the key. He went inside the church. He didn't see churches prior to that. He went inside the church. He looked at what was going on. He said Allah. When it was time for the salah, the monk of the church said, Amir al muminin you can pray right here. Give barakah in the church. Pray right here. He said, I'm not praying here. So that the Muslims can think it's okay to pray here. But he went to the church. I'm not telling anyone to go to the church. I'm telling you, if someone wanted to hear Al-Islam and the Dawah, and we took this opinion, we don't sit with people who make mistakes. We don't sit with people who are ignorant. We don't sit with anyone. And Imam Ahmed said, don't sit with the people of Al-Ahwa, Al-Bida, all of them. Nah. That's the general ruling. If you don't have the ability to protect yourself, don't sit with them. If you don't have any knowledge to give and you make it effective, don't sit with them. But your family, your mother, your father, they believe that the Nabi Wasallam is Hazim Nazim. You guys know Hazim Nazim, right? Do you guys know that? Hadir with Ba, with Ba, Ba, Hadir, Mujud, Nadir, and no younger, younger. Allah, the Prophet is here, and he sees everything. He's everywhere, and he sees and knows everything. That's Hazim Nazim, with some of our brothers from Pakistan and stuff like that. Asian brothers, that's what they believe. Many of our relatives believe that. So as a young person, when I start reading books, and I want to practice correctly, read them, I want to do it the right way, I come to this, and Imam Ahmed said the people of the Sunnah don't sit with these people, 
to say to my parents, and Halas, I'm done with you. My father is part, he's from the people of innovation, he's from the people of design. Anyone, you have a responsibility to give him the siha first. You have a responsibility to give him dawah in Allah. So we have to learn this, you young brothers. We have to learn the rules, the dawabit of al hajj al hajj if I'm going to abandon someone and by cutting him off, he's going to do more craziness and more wrong that I shouldn't abandon him. I should try to stick with him. During the time of Rasulullah, he saw Allah, he was certain three of his companions. They didn't go out in the war of Tabuk. They stayed behind, and they didn't have any reason to stay behind. When the Prophet went to the war, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he came back, those three people were there. Some of the Munafiqeen were coming, hypocrites who didn't go, and they came to give their excuses. Rasulullah knew they were Munafiqeen, they would just accept their excuses. But these three, they were believers. And one of them, Ka'b ibn Malik, said, I had the ability to lie, but I was afraid if I lied, Allah would expose me. So I went and I said, Ya Rasulullah, I had no reason to stay behind. And the other two, they had no reason. The Prophet ﷺ told the community, boycott them. Boycott them. Now, so Rasulullah ﷺ, the with these three companions, anybody know how many days? Anybody know? 50 days. Kaab ibn Malik said, I will come into the masjid. Rasulullah will be sitting and he will watch me come into the masjid. Kaab said, I will say, Salaamu Alaikum. He said, Rasulullah would turn his face. I don't know if he even gave me the salams back. He just wanted to get salams for 50 days. And then, and then, during the time, the Prophet told all of your wives, you, the wives, boycott them. Don't have relationships with them. One of the men, his wife came and said, Ya Rasulullah, my husband, my husband is a sheikh, he's an old man, he needs me. I have to cook for him, I have to help him. He's old. And if I abandon him and boycott him, it's going to be a bigger mafsad, a bigger problem. Then Nabi said, okay, you can stay, take care of him, but that's it. Not one of those women, not one of them, hesitated in what the Prophet said. Boycott your husband. They would say, okay. So Allah Ta'ala revealed an ayah of that incident. And from what he mentioned in the ayah, فَضَاقَتْ بِهِمْ الْأَوْلِ بِمَا رَحُبَتْ The earth for these three people, the earth shrunk on them. Because they were like alone. The Muslims are not dealing with them. They're not. Now, look at the point here, Ikhwani. What's the point here? When those people were in the community with strong Muslims, رضي الله عنهم, Rasulullah is there, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When they were like that, and people were boycotting them, it affected them. They made Tawbah to Allah. Tawbah. They made Tawbah Nasuha. After they made Tawbah and Allah freed them, when one of them, a man went, the Prophet read the ayah that Allah forgave them, the man went and told one of them, he came running to the masjid. When he came into the masjid, he was so happy, he took off. The thing that he had to work, wherever he gave it to the guy, Salah, he was so happy. So the point is, we boycott people when we're going to get a change. Don't boycott your child, don't boycott your relative, don't boycott the Muslim, don't boycott the ignorant one, don't boycott the innovator, just the person who's doing an innovation. Don't boycott people just to boycott. Allah commanded in the Quran, Wahjurhum. Hajran Jamila. Boycott them with a boycott that's Jamil. Don't just boycott. Let the boycott be Jamil. You boycott them at the right time, at the right place, in the right way. So these three issues are issues of the deen. They're imperative. They're in our everyday lives. It's just not for scholars and students of knowledge. This is in our everyday life. So therefore, Anybody, anyone, people are teaching people crazy things, don't go to listen. It's not permissible in the deen. You may go, as those scholars used to say, the heart is like a sponge, and you're not in control of it. Sometimes you can hear something, goes into your heart, next thing you know, 
You'll be an individual who curses the companions. You'll be an individual who starts saying crazy things. So that's why I command Ahmed Rahim and Allah Ta'ala mentioned these issues. Okay, Khwani, if you brothers have any questions first, the questions concerning the dars, these three issues that we'll, we mentioned, we'll deal with those questions. And if we exhaust that, we have time, we'll deal with the other general questions. Khwani, if you can shake it. I see the celebration of the Prophet's so-called birthday, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as being an innovation that is hakikiyya, a real innovation, because there are no ayat of the Quran to support it. There are no ayats or hadith to support this legislation. Not only that, but the Muslims did not do this until after the fourth century. 400 years after Islam began, did the Muslims start doing this. So the first three generations, the best of this ummah, as the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, خَيْرُ the best century, the best people are the people who I was sent to. The first 100 years. And then the second 100 years. And then the third 100 years. The companions, the Tabi'un, and the followers of the Tabi'un. They are the best generation. And none of them knew this thing. You will never find an Imam Malik, an Imam Abu Hanifa, an Imam Shafi, an Imam Ahmed saying the Mawlid is halal, haram, bid'ah, sunnah. you never find that because they never heard of it. It wasn't being done. And as I mentioned, if it was something that was good, Rasulullah would have ordered it somewhere. It would have found something. The companions would have done it. But for four centuries, no one did it. And then after four centuries, there was a king who started it. And the goal and the objective was to remember Rasulullah So he made a lot of food, sweet dishes. He gave a thousand gold dirhams to the people who made poetry about the Nabi. The more you do, he give you money. And then it stayed like that till the 600th, 6th century. Then the Muslims came and stopped it. Stopped it. The Ulam of Islam stopped it. No more. Milad. No more. They stopped it. For 200 years. And then in the 8th century, they started it again. And the people started celebrating it in different ways. Now, when you think some Ibadah from Al Islam would go through this history, not only that, do you know who gave that to the Muslims? Do you know who were the people who started it again and gave it to the Muslims? They were the Bataniyin, from the Fatiniyin, a group of people who went to Mecca, the Qiramata. They went to Mecca, they killed over 30,000 Muslims and threw their bodies in the Zamzam water. They broke the Kaaba and took the black stone with them. They're the ones who gave us this. Where is the intellect of the Muslims? Where is the intellect? Now that's not to say that everybody who does this is, is in the hellfire. That's not to say that. And if anyone understands he doesn't love us all a lot, he's mutashaddit. I say, come on, you're not being fair, you're not being just. Did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi any delil for that? It's a bida haqiqiyya. It has no delil. It's not like these other innovations that have a delil, but it's being used the wrong way. So it should be avoided. It should be avoided altogether. But again, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the companion, he said to the people, how is it going to be when the fitna comes? The sunnah will be looked at bid'ah, and bid'ah will be looked at the sunnah. If you change something in it, the people will say, the sunnah has been changed.
So if you tell people, don't do this, we've been doing this in our masjid for 30 years, okay, we're gonna stop doing it now. The people are gonna say, oh, the sunnah has been changed. This is what has happened to the ummah ahi, the kurubah. <coughs> Any more questions, Akhwan? What about, what about, uh, what about uh, fast and Mondays? Fasting on Mondays? Yeah, regarding to the question, the brother's question, fast on Mondays. Who? You asked about no, fasting? No, no, I'm saying about the celebration of the Prophet Sallallahu the day was... Oh, yeah. oh, oh. Someone may say, you know, one of the deals to celebrate the Prophet's birthday <coughs> is that when they asked him, why do you fast on Mondays and Thursdays? He said, because the Quran was revealed on that day to me, and I was born on that day. So someone can say, yeah, so it has some delil to it. I say, okay, I'm going to agree with you, Yani, for the sake of argument, it has a delil. But it's still a bid'ah, So I'm still going to say, even if that's a delil. But I'm really going to say, that's not a delil. And that's because some scholars, there's ikhtilaf. Was he born on that day, Monday, or was he born on Thursday? Did the revelation come on Monday? Did the revelation come on Thursday? The other issue is, when he said that, did he do what we do concerning the celebration? The halawa, the food, the things that we do. Did the, did the companions take that ayah? Did they take that, that reality and say, Okay, let us remember and acknowledge what he, he was born on that day, so let us do this and let's... No, they didn't do it. So even if a person were to use that as a proof, ahlahuma mur, ahlahuma mur, whatever it is, even if we say, okay, it's a delil, it's still an innovation that is an additional one. It shouldn't be done. Simple as. Any more questions, Ikhwani? Any more questions? Now, for dinner to share, just I'm going to ask you on uh, basically 27 of Ramadan. Some people make just a celebration just for the intention. It's not all the community Muslim, but some specific people just uh, welcoming that month. So in the 27th night of Ramadan, there are proofs that suggest the 21st is Laylatul Qadr. Some prove the 23rd is Laylatul Qadr. Some prove the 25th is Laylatul Qadr. Not can be, is. And some proofs show that the 29th is Laylatul Qadr. Out of all of the proofs, the one proof that is the strongest that appears 27 is, is stronger than all of the other ones. But you can't make a jazzle. You can't say, Wallahi, it's the 27. All of those numbers, they have proofs. All of them, 21, 23, 25, 27, 29, all of them have to deal. But the 27th possibly being Dayu to other seems to be the strongest. And that's how it's been in this Ummah for centuries. So the fact that people may be lax during the last 10 days, but when the 27th comes, they come to the masjid. And the Imam extends the dua even more on that night. Are we going to say that is blameworthy? We're not going to say that is blameworthy. He didn't come to the masjid all Ramadan. But on the 27th he came. He came every night, but he never cried. But on the 27th he was crying. All of that. It's the meal. But with the 27th possibly being later to color, it doesn't mean that we stretch it out either and we start doing celebrations that Allah just did not send down any proof for. Celebrations in Al Islam, they are well known, but they have to be within their hudud. And it's not just because what Amr Bakr Zayd thinks and feels. So there's no celebration for later to color as such. Later to color, the ibadat that have been legislated is praying in that night, asking Allah for forgiveness, going to the masjid, asking people to forgive you. These are the things that are legislated. 
as for parties and celebrations and things like that, special food and this and that, it's not what the Prophet said. Okay, Ikhwati Fingahi. In the Tafia, we have a brother, when I saw Allah Ta'ala, and we're fucking up with Yakum. Hada, was Allah, was Allah, and I'm the Bina, while I had him, was Allah, and I'm the Jemaine.